Tonight on Up Close Primetime, Kobe Bryant. His trophy case is full, and he's still hungry. The legacy that the Lakers have uh, forces us to remain hungry. Allen Iverson, you've got questions, we've got answers. I make mistakes like every other human. I just try to learn from them. And renegade owner Mark Cuban on why he challenges authority. You knew what you were saying or doing could in any way hurt this game. Would I'm you doing. finally shut it? Yeah. 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 But, but you, I've never felt that. No. Not, not ever. Up next on Up Close Primetime. Welcome to Staples Center here in Los Angeles. I'm Roy Firestone, and this is Up Close Primetime. Tonight, the hottest and most combustible names in the NBA today. Kobe, Iverson, Cuban. Leading off with a 23-year-old phenomenon who hasn't found the ceiling yet. He's already got two rings and an all-star MVP. And lots of things to say about his persona and his potential. He is the Lakers' Kobe Bryant. How good a player are you now compared to what you really want to be? Rate yourself compared to what you think you're capable of being. I don't know what I'm capable of being. I have no idea. Uh, all I try to do is find a niche where I can benefit the team and help elevate their games. Uh, that's how I judge my individual game, is how I'm able to elevate guys like Devin George and, and, and Slava Medvedenko and, and, uh, and Derek Fisher and, all, and my teammates. Do you think that was always so? Uh, early on in your career, your younger man come into the pros, did you have a need to show everybody that you belonged and because of that didn't really concern yourself as much as you should have about elevating other people's games? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I first came into the league, I was uh, more trying to prove myself as an individual basketball player. And not really thinking about uh, my teammates or trying to lead them uh, because, I, you know, that wasn't my role at the time. And, uh, you know, last year I felt like it was really my job to, to make sure uh, the team was moving in the right direction and to really become more of a, a vocal leader. And that was one of my weaknesses. Criticized in the past for being distant from his teammates, Kobe was allegedly involved in a scuffle with teammate Samaki Walker on February 21. This, just after he assured us his relationship with all of his teammates, was shored up during the past offseason. Really one of the great stories of this year is your relationship with Shaq. Not only are you guys close, you are business partners. He's also touting you for being MVP. I don't know if it was ever as bad as people made it out to be, but certainly there's been a big change, and you guys are buds now. Oh, yeah. You know, we never disliked one another. Um, I think that's a huge misconception. I think um, we had our moments where it was hard to play with one another, but we never disliked one another. Um, and, yeah, well, now we're, you know, we're very good friends, actually. We enjoy playing together um, to the point where sometimes Phil has to get on us because we're playing too much together and we um, tend to forget about the rest of the floor. <laughs> uh, which, I guess, it, you know, it's a good thing to see that. It's, it's, it's encouraging. In fact, when O'Neal was suspended over an on-court incident this year, Bryant wore Shaq's number and took his game to another level, scoring 56 points in three quarters. Count it again for Kobe Bryant! Was that a statement? It was a statement. Uh, you know, that's the most upset I've ever been in a basketball game. Do you think Shaq's suspension was, I'm not trying to get you in trouble with the league, but do you think it was handled properly? Do you think maybe they saw all the sides? Or do you see things that even the average fan may not even see on night after night after night underneath the basket away from the cameras? Yeah, well, it's impossible for the average fan to see the kind of beating Shaquille takes. I mean, people say he's 7'2", 300 and whatever pounds. He dishes out a lot, but he takes a... He takes a beating. I mean, people literally jump on his neck to foul him. And no matter the size of an individual, somebody's jumping on your neck. I mean, you have to remember, these guys are uh, still 6'6", 200 and something pounds, 6'7", 200 and something pounds. I mean, he takes a pretty good beating. Does he awe you out there on the court? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, especially when he has, like, three guys hanging on his back. <laughs> and in the playoffs, it doesn't matter. He'll just go straight through them. Uh, because that's when his intensity picks up even more and we're playing for higher stakes. And he'll just jump through three people hanging on his hanging on his back. And he'll dunk the ball extremely hard. And I just, I'll look at him actually doing the game and I just laugh. <laughs> I mean, what are you doing, man? 
I want to talk about his assessment that you're going to be the MVP this year. Well, he wants to see you become the MVP. Is it important to you, MVP? It's, it's not important to me. Um, it's not on my uh, list of goals uh, to accomplish for this season. Uh, priority number one for me coming into this season was making sure my teammates improve. Are you, with back-to-back -back titles and favored to win a third, as a team and as an individual, are you hungry enough? Oh, definitely. Oh, we're still starving. You know, the, the legacy that the Lakers have um, forces us to remain hungry. Uh, you know, Magic and Kareem were able to win back-to-back -back titles, uh, but yet they weren't able to three-peat. That's something that motivates us and keeps us going. There's a perception, though, that the Lakers are looking to just shift gears. They're losing to teams they shouldn't, that maybe hey, when push comes to shove, we'll get it up into a different gear? Or is that a dangerous game to play? Uh, it's a dangerous game to play if we were playing it. Uh, it's, the teams that have beat us, they, they've beat us. <laughs> you know, it's not a conscious thing on our part to turn our game down and turn it up. Um, if the competition is, 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 is greater, then obviously we'll step our game up to another level. I think that's just competitive instinct, but it's not something that we consciously do. It's a process of consciously moving forward and consciously improving. And that's what we're doing right now. You know, sometimes you have to take a couple steps back to just take one step forward. As Up Close Primetime continues, Kobe Bryant on the effect of September 11th. After that day, I started approaching practice with a renewed freshness uh, because I knew uh, how important life was, how important every day is. As Up Close Primetime continues. Welcome back to Up Close Primetime. I'm Roy Firestone. You know, it might be said that in the NBA, a boy grows into a man rather quickly. But even though there are big responsibilities in the game, Kobe Bryant found that growing up in real life is far more demanding. It is quite literally a life and death situation. And Kobe began a new life this past April. Tell me about married life. You know, being married uh, to my wife Vanessa, is, I, it's fun. I mean, I, we have a good time together. Um, I love her tremendously, and, um, but we're best friends too. We'll, we'll go out and hang out and have a good time and enjoy each other's company and uh, you know, we just love kicking it together. A lot of people say, Kobe, come on, you got some time. Mm -hmm. What was the rush? What was the hurry? It's funny hearing people in LA uh, say things like that and then you, know, you walk down the street or go to a restaurant or something and you see a man who's 65 years old married to like some 20 year old. <laughs> It's pretty funny, but no, for us, we, you know, we looked at it like um, you know, as a blessing, uh, being fortunate because we were able to find a person that we're going to spend the rest of our lives with at the age, at a young age. You know, so this means we have a, you know, many, many years to spend together. Of course, after the tragedy of September 11th, Kobe, like the rest of the world, found out how precious time with loved ones really is. In fact, Newsweek magazine wanted to do an article with his observations of the traumatic event. Kobe chose to write it in his own words. I felt like to have it really come from the heart and to be really genuine. Uh, it's a piece that I should really focus on and take some time and do it myself. And then when the article came out, uh, to have the opportunity to, to see it and, and to read uh, what it is that I was feeling, um, it, was a, it was a great feeling. You... Uh didn't feel anything more profoundly, perhaps, than anybody else in this country, but because you're a celebrity and people put more value, perhaps, in what you said. I wonder if you can capsulize your feelings, your reflections, maybe how your life was changed. Now, for my generation, it's pretty much, that was our Kennedy assassination. That was our Pearl Harbor. We've never experienced anything so tragic before. Um, so when the events were taking place, I, I really didn't know what I was feeling. Um, it took a couple of days to kind of sit back and put things in perspective on what exactly was taking place. You know, my wife and I, we talked about it a great deal um, about how this was not only going to affect us, um, but affect the world. Um, and we're still talking about it to this day. And, you know, as far as the little things uh, that come out of, out of this event, you know, you know things like uh, valuing each day. Uh, you know, cherishing the moments that we have here, uh, valuing uh, 
um, the love that we have for one another, uh, speaking of myself and my wife. And, uh, but not only that, but just relationships that we have with people as a whole. I think sometimes we, we get to moving too fast in life and we tend to overlook these things. You take things for granted. Oh, oh most you take definitely. take our jobs for granted, our, our relationships for granted. Most definitely. Every day. Most definitely. And uh, after that day, I started approaching practice with a renewed freshness uh, because I knew uh, how important life was, how important every day is, and uh, to just really take it one day at a time. I want to talk now about some players around the league and get your assessments of certain players and the things about their game that you love. But I'm going to start with the most obvious guy, with Mr. Jordan. Is he playing a different game than he did a few years ago? I think his game now is more uh, determined by uh, balance and trying to get his defender off balance or mm -hmm. off center, uh, so then he can, you know, take advantage of his uh, take advantage of his opponents. Is there part of you that's that's awed by what he did and how he did it and laying off as long as he did and, and still dominating the way he does? Not really, no, because he he's been doing this for so many years. I, I don't think. Uh, there wasn't anybody out there who seriously doubted his comeback. I think everybody knew there were going to be some nights where he was more effective than others, some nights when his legs couldn't carry him. There were going to be other nights where he scores 45 points or whatever it is. Um, but Michael's always had a great deal, a great work ethic. Uh, so I really, I'm really not too surprised at what he's doing right now. Kobe, we're doing a piece in, in this show. Allen Iverson's going to be featured as well. He, he likes to, to play the role, and I'm not saying it's phony, but he, he, he likes the, the street thing. You've never been a street guy. You've always been a little bit of a loner in some ways. Talk about the differences in terms of your approach to the game as opposed to, and your upbringing mm -hmm. and, and his approach and his upbringing. Well, I, I think the, the differences are, are, are very noticeable from, uh, from afar. Uh, I think what's even more intriguing are our similarities as far as uh, the tenacity with which we play the game. Uh, you know, yeah, he plays with the, I guess you can say a quote-unquote street attitude. And uh, with me, it's the same way. I didn't grow up in the streets, but uh, I play with a certain attitude, a certain aggression, uh, and a competitive spirit, and the tenacity that we both share. And uh, I think that's even more intriguing than, than our differences. What about Jason Kidd? Somebody said to me this week that he thought Jason Kidd deserves to be the MVP at this point in the season. What do you admire about what he's doing? He's a leader. He gets people to play unselfishly. Um, he thinks team first. And uh, what I admire about him is that attitude. He's, a, he's the number one team player. Last year, the Laker victory parade, instead of wearing your number eight, you wore the number 44. Mm -hmm. Obviously, 44 is Jerry West's number. Why is he so important in your life as a basketball man, and why is, does his opinion matter perhaps more than almost anybody else's? Jerry's been teaching me the game from day one. Since I first arrived here as a 17-year-old, he's always been teaching me just about the game uh, of basketball, and he's always believed in me. Uh, even when people had their doubts and people were criticizing me, he always believed in me. And, um, and, and when people were praising me, he would call me up and he would critique me. And uh, he was always honest and always gave you his honest opinion. And um, you know, I respect that tremendously. Do you think that in view of all the advice he's given you, there's any one thing that he said that really stuck more than anything else? Everything that he's taught me, everything that he's showed me, I've, I've been able to use and, um, to this point. And uh, so it's not really one thing that jumps out at me and say, you know, I use that in my life on a daily basis or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but everything has been extremely insightful. What does the game give to you that you couldn't have gotten in any other line of work? Well, what I found out is that the game of basketball has really been a great teacher of life uh, as far as um, unending challenges, uh, teamwork, you know, doing things together. Getting along. Getting along, learning the ups and downs uh, of a season and, you know, enjoying the journey of the season and it's really helped me mature. Uh, I've heard Michael use that quote before and I've heard Magic use a quote before uh, saying how the game has really been a teacher of life for them. And um, a couple years ago, I really didn't understand what they were talking about. I, I couldn't see that. Uh, but now I, I, can, I can definitely say the same thing. 
You know, I look at, at this incredible career you've had, and you're still just, what, 23? Mm -hmm. Do you appreciate it at this young an age, or do you have to be a little bit older to step back and say, wow, what an un unbelievable ride this has been. What, a, what an extraordinary opportunity and blessing I've had in my life. That's something that I do now, yes. Uh, it's something that I've been able to do at the end of last season, kind of step back and just enjoy the moment. Uh, and more so after September 11th. Uh, not just the game of basketball, but just just little things, just going to the store and, you know, or going to the movies or something like that. Uh, I've been able to kind of just sit back and just en enjoy life and just enjoy the, enjoy the day at a time. As up close prime time continues, Maverick owner Mark Cuban reveals what it will take to shut him up. And Allen Iverson on his needs. Do you have a need to be understood? I want it, but I told my mom, if I do die before, her, just put misunderstood on my grave. What up close prime time returns. Welcome back to Up Close Primetime. I'm Roy Firestone. By NBA standards, Allen Iverson is a little man in a big man's game. His detractors might say that at barely six feet tall, he plays with a chip on his shoulder with a little man's complex. His admirers say that's exactly what makes him great. A rare interview with the Sixers answer man. If I could think of one quality of your game that represents your life, it's the drive. The explosiveness, the speed, the determination. Take that, the drive, and parallel it to your life. You know, I'm always um, going hard for what I want out of life. I'm, I work hard um, to be the uh, best father I can, the best um, husband, best son, best brother, friend, cousin, teammate. You know, so I think you know, that's the similarity, just pushing off hard and trying hard to be the best at those things. He is anything but Madison Avenue. Allen Iverson is decidedly street, and he plays to that image with a bravado, a sneer perhaps, but with no apologies. You have 22 different tattoos, maybe there's more now, but the two that intrigue me the most are the Chinese tattoos. The word loyalty, and respect in Chinese. Why are those two words important to Allen Iverson? Because I feel like, you know, my, my family and my friends is really all I got in this world. You know, you got money, you got fame, celebrity. But without the money, you know, and the celebrity and the fame, you, know, you still have the family and the friends. And that make you feel better than being able to buy something. You can't buy love, you know, and that's what I get from, from the people that care about me and the people that I care about, my family and my friends. How about respect? Do you play for respect? Do you think you have respect now? I think you gotta earn respect. I think I have respect. Um, get a lot of respect from a lot of my peers, a lot of the guys that I play with, a lot of the guys that is in my age group just because of you know, what I've been through in my life and what I was able to overcome and what I'm still overcoming. And he's settling down more. This past summer, Allen Iverson married his girlfriend of nine years, the mother of his two children. And yet, those joys were met with tragedy as his best friend, Ra Langford, was murdered in a domestic dispute. The thing with Ra was the toughest that I ever had to deal with in my life because I never lost a friend that I was that close to. I mean. I knew him 11 or 12 years of my life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he helped me out because a lot of things that I pay attention to now, um, I didn't pay attention to before. Like? Having more value on the things that mean something to me, paying more attention to my family, my friends, and you know, trying to just do everything the right way, making sure that I do have a, a will and there is something for my family if something never happens to me. You know, I'm, I probably won't never stop thinking about them, but I think every day that goes by, 
that I know that he's gone is helping me more and more because I'm starting to kind of be able to deal with it. And he's dealt with quite a bit, too. He grew up in abject poverty, saw two father figures incarcerated, and spent four months in jail himself for participating in a racially motivated brawl, a conviction which was later overturned for lack of evidence. You lived without electricity for a period of time because your mom had to make a choice between eating and having electricity. Uh, the only father figure you knew was in and out of jail. Did you have enough love? Did you have enough affection? I had enough. I think that's the reason for me being here now. I love the person who my mom raised. And she had you at 15. Yeah, and I just, I respect her so much for everything she endured, everything she went through to make sure I would be able to be right here talking to you about this right now. And, um, you know, I know my mom went through hell trying to provide for me and my sisters. But my dad played a big part in it, too. You know, um, the man who raised you. Yeah. Your real father wasn't around. No. Nah, but the guy who raised me, he played a big part in my life. But I, I just was never no one to complain about a lot of things. I always just tried to overcome any obstacle that was placed in, in front of me. Even know? when you went to jail for four months, why didn't you complain? You were in jail, you're a kid. Because I had no time. You know, I, I, everything that I concentrated on was getting my life together once and if I got a second chance. And I always believed that God would give me that second opportunity. I never felt better. That's why I still go to the Hampton Roads area and do charity events, mm -hmm. you know, just to let those people know. A certain group of people did that to me, but not the whole city. He may not have always done the right thing, but people closest to Allen Iverson say he's trying to now. He still no shows for events like the All-Star Press Conference, but he does show for charitable events like his softball fundraiser in Virginia and his visits to the boys and girls clubs. Is it true that one of your dreams is to build a hospital? Yeah. That's something you promised your mom as a kid, right? Yeah, I mean, that's some. Um, you know, I really respect Dikembe Mutombo for, and he's already beat me to the punch. He's building it in Africa, West yeah. Africa, right? But that's something, that's something that I want to do. I mean, you only live once, so it's just important for you to live every day like it's your last and make the best of it. Do you have a need to be understood? I want it, but I told my mom, and you know, hopefully I will die before her because I don't want to be here to see that day. So if I do die before her, just put misunderstood on my gravestone. When we come back, the answer to the coach, Allen Iverson's on and off relationship with Larry Brown. I don't want to paint a picture that I'm bad for this game because I can't get along with my coach. As Up Close Primetime continues. Welcome back to Up Close Primetime, I'm Roy Firestone. No one will ever mistake Allen Iverson for Grant Hill. In fact, if a player had a rating, he would be parental discretion advised. And though Iverson has come a long way from the often truant, petulant player of the past, he can still frustrate his coach with his bad timing, and some might even say bad manners. You and Larry Brown, is it love-hate, love-love, father-son, or are you just alike? We're, I think we're alike in a lot of ways, but I don't think there's any hate in it, because I don't hate anybody, and I know the person that he is. I know he don't have any hate for anybody. Has your relationship matured and grown? It's been good. It's been up and down. It's, I mean, it's been a competitive player and a competitive coach. You know, without Coach Brown, I wouldn't have been the MVP. I mean, I think Coach Brown and myself will probably continue to have little beefs here and there, but I don't think that's so bad for the game. I mean, I, and I don't want to paint a picture that I'm bad for this game because I can't get along with my coach. Let's face it, there were some 75, over the past several years, some 75 missed practices. That's got to drive you nuts. I don't know if that's the right number. He, he's missed his share of practices, uh, far too many, but a lot of that changed last year. Um, he's been much, much better, you know, every year. I think he wants to win, he wants to prepare. He's learning about this. This is something he's never had to address before. You know, his idea to me, and he said it numerous times, he said, Coach, I give you 48 minutes every time I play. I never leave anything on the court. 
I want to win, you know how much I care about winning, and I don't have an issue with that at all. My big thing is, if you're the best player, you need to set an example in practice, you need to set an example by the way you act. And I think he wants to do that, and he's made great strides, but it's still not perfect. Alan, Larry said you were playing the best basketball of your career when he was out. Do you agree with that? Yeah, my coach said I definitely agree with that. <laughs> I mean, that's the compliment I want to hear. The media. Sum it up in a paragraph or less. Unfair and fair. Jordan. Are you the anti-Jordan? Anti. I think so. I think we have a lot of similarities as far as our competitiveness and just wanting to be the best. But when you say that name, I mean, that's bigger than life, you know? And just to mention my name in the same sentence with Michael Jordan's, that's enough for me because I know that nobody will be able to fill those shoes. It could take 20 of us in this league and all of us to try to stuff our feet in that shoe, and it wouldn't fit. Kobe. One of the best players in the world. Something special come out of you when you see him score 57? Do you want to score 58? Nah. <laughs> nah. Because, I mean... Kobe has something that I don't have. I mean, Kobe has two championships, and that's what I want. So right now, you can't even talk about me in the same sentence with Kobe because of just that. You think you're going to have a long career? You're going to be around at 35 playing this game? Or do you see yourself as a, a, a speeding meteor playing through this game and maybe burning out a little early? I don't think I'll burn out. Everybody thought I'd be burned out by now, you know? So that's just something that I deal with. It's everybody always talks about what flaws a certain guy has, and, you know, he plays this way, and he might not be able to make it through all the bumps and bruises, but God helped me get this far. So I believe he'll help me go as far as he wants me to. Last question. I know you said it before at the top. You want to be the best father. You want to be the best role model you can be. What do you want your own children and the millions of kids who look up to you to say about you. That I'm human. I want them to know that I'm, I'm human. And I want them to know that I make mistakes like every other human. I just try to learn from them and try to be a better person every day. And don't try to be the same person as Allen Iverson. Don't try to be the basketball person that Allen Iverson is. Try to be a better person than Allen Iverson is. Try to be a better basketball player. And the sky's the limit for you. When we come back, the NBA's Maverick owner justifies his unconventional methods. I've got almost a $300 million investment. And to me, what I'm doing is good business. Mark Cuban, what Up Close Primetime returns. Up Close Primetime, I'm Roy Firestone. You know, F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote that the rich are different. Maverick's owner Mark Cuban is rich. At 43, he's a billionaire thanks to his shrewd dealings in the internet boom. And he certainly is different. Since he bought the team in January of 2000, it went from a nine-win laughingstock to eliminating the Jazz in the playoffs last year. And this year, Dallas is one of the league's top teams. But it's how Cuban operates that underscores his difference. He is most definitely a Maverick. Well, I appreciate and even admire the passion you have for your team. I believe your actions take away from the issues you raise. Your behavior allows the media to portray you as a crybaby, which in turn allows league officials to easily dismiss you. Why haven't you taken a more rational, reasonable approach when addressing the problem with the league? It's no surprise that the man who's worth $2.5 billion, thanks to the internet business, would choose email as his primary mode of communication. And my response to her is going to be, I've tried many, many times to do this privately behind the scenes. There's not an issue that I've raised publicly that I haven't raised privately dozens of times. So you get a thousand a day and you read every one of them? Every one of them, yeah. These are people who are more often than not you know, customers of the Mavericks or potential customers of the Mavericks or the NBA. And I would be doing the business a disservice if I didn't you know, think about my customers and see what was on their mind. In some ways, he is a traditionalist. Keep the customers satisfied. But Cuban, who sold his computer consulting business to CompuServe and made millions at age 31, isn't content to sit on his wallet. Money is in ideas. Cuban had an idea of putting radio and TV broadcasts on the internet. 
And after Yahoo bought his idea for billions, Cuban did the thing he most wanted to do in life. He went from season ticket holder to owner and bought the Mavericks. What's the hardest thing about watching the game as an owner that you couldn't do as a fan? You take it personally, maybe a little bit too much? Yeah, I mean, you, you go up and down with these games. Oh, man. You, you go up. It's easier to let go when you're a fan. To the casual observer, he's the obnoxious owner who sits in the front row, who racked up over a half million dollars in fines last year for being critical of the league and its officials. And in January, he received the highest fine ever levied in the NBA, half a million dollars for saying that chief official Ed Rush was so bad he wouldn't hire him to manage a Dairy Queen. And the coup de grace. Welcome to Dairy Queen, can I help you sir? Actually working a lunch shift at a local Dairy Queen to prove how much he respected the work they were doing. Perception, reality, whatever, this is what they say. The people who are critical. This is a kook. This is a guy who is a spoiled rich kid who came across several billion dollars and he's got expensive toys and he's running his mouth shut up <laughs> are they wrong completely who cares who cares what they say I mean I, I don't keep a little list of things people have said about me I couldn't care less I, I've set my goals why bang your head against the wall you have the second largest fine in sports history. Well, first, the amount is irrelevant. The fact that it's the largest, second largest, irrelevant. I've got almost a $300 million investment. And to me, what I'm doing is good business. I'm trying to do everything possible to improve the product, to put my business in a position to succeed. And when I look at how the NBA as a business is being run, whether it's the officiating group or other groups as well, I see all kinds of red flags. As we speak, you could be getting another fine. Okay. You're doing it again. <laughs> At what point do right you say, wait a minute here, maybe I should, I mean, I appreciate the, the doing day this I sell. The day I sell. If David Stern said, the next time you open your mouth, Mark, it's going to cost you a couple draft picks. Time for question then would things change a little bit? Now I'd, I'd have your to team. talk to my lawyer first to find out. But personnel issues. Uh, you know, you're right. No, that, that's a possibility, I think. But I'd have to think about it more closely. But then I think it would actually make the point even more strongly that he's afraid of something. I, I, if he did that, I would think that he was afraid. Is David Stern afraid of you? You'd have to ask him. I don't know. What do you think? I think David agrees with 99.99% .99 of what I say. But he just won't do it because I said it. Do you feel it's a threat, what you're saying to him? It, I mean... I'm not threatening in any way, shape, or form. I don't want his job. I'm not. You don't want to be NBA commissioner. Somebody no. said tomorrow, Mark Cuban, you can you can run the whole thing. No. You wouldn't want to do that. No. Isn't that what you're saying? No. You'd like, let me show you how to do it. Well, no. I'm saying it takes. I, I've got some advice for you on 20 plus years of running businesses that have worked for me. Please listen to me. At least give them a chance. But you haven't been doing this. For a long you haven't been an nba owner well let's put it this way running the mavericks the mavericks have been running the same for a long time you know the previous 11 years before i got here the it wouldn't have been described as the model franchise right you know i came i applied the same business principles that i'd known forever and it you know from a business perspective it's worked you know, we more than doubled our revenues. You know, our fan satisfaction is way up. Our, our employee satisfaction is way up. There's just some basic principles that apply to all businesses, regardless of what kind they are. What's the best idea you hadn't thought of that came through email? Oh, my goodness. I mean, from the most simplistic of three-sided 24-second um, clock to <laughs> after this Dairy Queen stuff, saying, look, Dairy Queen, DQ, disqualification, why don't you come up with a promotion that when someone's disqualified from the game on fouls, they get a coupon for Dairy Queen. It doesn't happen that often. So what do we do? I forward it to our sales rep. We went to Dairy Queen. I might be able to make my money back. You know? <laughs> You're not a traditionalist by and large, but you are a businessman. Yeah, I've never said anything other than that. I mean, the media is the one that said, oh, he's trying to change everything. No, man, this is business 101. I'm just asking the MBA to open up their, you know, go back to college, take a business class and open up business 101. How do you run a business? How do you market a business? Give me five things, just one line each, five things that are wrong with the NBA. Sales, marketing, focus, process optimization. Which is, that's big words. Um, process optimization meaning take every, everything that you do within your organization and ask yourself the question, are you doing it the best possible way? Hold it up to a light. It, yeah, and ask other people the same question. And one more thing, 
Go to rule number one and repeat. <laughs> Start at the top and repeat. Officiating. Uh huh. People are human beings. Uh huh. People make mistakes. Absolutely. It kind of makes it fun. So what's wrong? Why should Nothing. you second guess it? Um, Guys trying to do a good job at Rush, you know? Well, at Rush, that's management. That's not officiating. Okay. Big difference. All the, the guys that they have working is working their asses off, doing their best. Why are we not putting those officials, the 60, give or take a few people, and trying to put them in a position to succeed? Why are we not hiring the best possible officials that we can get? You don't think they're the best that you can get? Well, you ask yourself a question. I'm, I'm probably not the best qualified to answer this. Is the worst official in the NBA better than the best official in college basketball, or high school basketball for that matter? Yes or no? If you feel, or anybody that's part of this, the NBA family, if you will, mm -hmm. feels the answer is no, why are we not out there trying to hire the best college official? Do you think basketball games are fixed? No. Do you think other people in this league feel that they're fixed? No question about it. I've sat next to an owner who, with, with Russ Granick sitting right there who said he had no question in his mind that there were certain games that had been predetermined. And why do you think he thought so? The NBA doesn't communicate information at all. It's, 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 very, it's like a private society in a lot of respects. I don't even know how much David Stern gets paid. One of the first things an owner said to me when I came in, he goes, Mark, there's going to be times you want to fight David Stern. Don't do it. I've been in this league X, you know, X number of decades, decades, and I still don't know how much David Stern gets paid. That's all you need to know about how this organization is run. If you had just a one number one question, to underscore, if you could only ask one question, David had to be right here and answer it. What's the question you'd ask? Well, it's, I, asking questions is easy. David will answer any questions. <laughs> it's how he answers Yeah, it. yeah or will he take action? If I could ask one thing where he, he said, Mark, anything I will take action, you're granted one wish. I would just like open conversation on issues before they're decided. They just signed a new television deal, the NBA did, ratified uh, AOL, ESPN's involved, a lot of different things. Were the owners consulted in making this deal? There was one-on-one, -on -one, there was discussions. As a group, there were not discussions. You know, I have yet to be at a Board of Governors meeting where there's been an open, ongoing discussion. These are all successful people, Jerry Buss and Paul Allen and Jim Dolan, yet they don't shout, they don't scream, they don't get fined. And they don't go to the meetings anymore either. And you find that? Very telltale. Why do you think they don't go? I know what they tell me because what's the point? They're not the, being listened to. The agenda's already set when you get there. Um, now I'm really going to get in trouble. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. You, you don't want to be king. No. You just want a better kingdom. Yes. That's it. You know, the more people, the more the emperor shouts and screams and yells and finds, it just raises more questions. I'm the easiest. I've said this to David multiple times, dozens of times. I am the easiest guy in the NBA to shut up. The easiest. Just take, Listen. Just, just, do, just take some simple actions. You know, if I question the officiating, if I, if I question the process of how the officials are managed, bring in a third party. I, I promise I will sign on the dotted line. I won't even use the word referee or official ever in a sentence again. Why won't they do that? I don't know. Maybe because they don't want to give me the satisfaction. You are in your early 40s. Um, 20s. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Do you think at some point you might look back when you're 50 and say, ah, I was a little brash there. Nah, maybe, maybe my ego was driving me a little too much. I should have learned. Maybe the message was not being received. I could have done it differently. There's no question. I'll, I'll always reevaluate. And there's, yeah, there's absolutely that chance. Boy, Any I second guessing in recent weeks or months or even last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I continually second guess myself. I mean, if, if I asked the NBA to continually improve the process and reevaluate themselves, then I'd be kind of hypocritical if I didn't do the same thing on myself. Right. So there's no question. I, I ask myself, is there a better way to do it? You know, I, I've been calling owners and without exception, it's been, no, you still shouldn't fight David. <laughs> That's not good enough. Welcome back to Up Close Primetime. I'm Roy Firestone. In a sports world of eccentric owners, the late Charlie Finley, Al Davis, George Steinbrenner, Mark Cuban may be the most unusual of all. He was once a door-to-door -door salesman, and he made so much money by the age of 40, he actually bought a jet on the Internet. Yet he owns very few personal possessions, and the only thing he seems to truly value are his friendships and fun. I have a list of things on my checklist of things that I, I would have liked I, to have accomplished before I'm gone, you know, and when they offered me the chance to do a TV show, I said, check, you know, the chance to have a jet, 
check. Chance to be in a movie, check. You know, the chance to lay on the beach and read a great book, check. You know, I, I'm not, one of, if I have a big fear, one of my greatest fears is 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, looking back on my life and say, boy, I wish I would have tried this. Boy, I had a chance to do that. Boy, I wish I would have stood up for myself and did what I believed. I'd rather do what I believe and think is right and, and go down in flames then then just oh boy everybody says this isn't the way to do it are you a little crazy no oh, well depends on the it depends on the reference point right well um, here, here's a guy who's got what a 25,000 square foot mansion with, with no, no furniture, furniture. <laughs> no furniture right am right. i atypical yes you're worth two billion dollars you have very little food in the refrigerator you have pre pre-packaged chicken breasts it's a little eccentric, wouldn't you agree? If I didn't have the money, if I, if I w wasn't doing this interview and we, you were just hanging out with me and I said, come on over to my house and it, was, it wasn't 22,000 square feet, it was a 1,200 foot apartment and you saw the exact same thing, you'd say, I know 100 guys like you. You know, the size of my wallet doesn't define who I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, I mean, I don't let anybody pinch me because it all might, you know, go away. Are you afraid of losing it all? Yeah. You are. You yeah. admit that. Well, who wouldn't be? I mean, there's always that, the inf hopefully it's infinitesimal chance, you know. I, you know, you plan for the worst and hope for the best. So you all, you know, there's always that part of me, you know, the way I've been brought up, the parents, you know, children of the depression, you know, save, scrap, da, da, da. There's always that fear. I heard some unbelievable things about you <laughs> in your early days. That you sold garbage bags door to door. When I was 12 years old to get gym shoes, yeah. That you work for a buck sixty an hour. And when they raised the minimum wage to two forty, I was the happiest kid on the block. You know. You remember the hungry years vividly? Is it something you wanted? Oh yeah! When I first came to Dallas, I lived six guys in a three bedroom apartment. Okay, I didn't have my own bed. I had a crusty pillow that that sat in a corner of the room, and I had a blanket that I would put all my stuff under. It was one hundred twenty eight dollars a month for the apartment the shared phone and the shared electricity. And when we didn't have any money, the guys that I, I shared the, the three bedroom apartment with, um, we would kite checks to each other. So I'd write him a check and he'd write him to a check and he'd write him and the last guy would write the rent check, knowing that it would take time for all of the- You're the floating checks. money. Yeah, big time. Though he has a somewhat Spartan approach personally, he spares no expense for his team. His state-of-the-art facilities are the talk of the league. Luxuries like flat screen TVs for every player with personal DVDs and stereos. Are you running a country club here? Well, let's put it this way. Guys have no excuses. And if they don't produce, they're gone. I've said it very specifically to the guys. I'm not loyal to players. I'm loyal to the ring. Anybody who works for me, whether you're a receptionist or a player, I'm going to do everything possible to put you in a position to succeed. But we all have to keep our eyes on the prize. Being profitable, winning a ring. Do you think there are people who want to see you fall on your ass? Sure. In the league, at the office? Sure. You know what? You know, with you David? Can, I don't know. You'd have to, I don't think so. Where are we heading with the NBA in this new millennium? What, what, what is your concern and where are you bullish for well, the league? The good news is we have, I think, the best sports product in the world. The product itself is phenomenal. The, where the, are your concerns? The, the, the concern is, are we doing a good job marketing it? And the answer is no. I don't think so. I look at the PC industry, right? The PC industry's had a ton of problems. Then you have a company like Dell. Michael Dell doesn't say, boy, the industry's having problems. We're just floating along with the industry. He gets aggressive. He advertises more than anybody. He sells harder than anybody. He just gets totally aggressive, eats up market share, and basically works to put the other guys out of business. The NBA doesn't have that type of, let's go out and get better. You know, we, we've got a lot of dilution in the TV industry. Ratings are down everywhere. You know, I asked the question multiple times, why are we not getting aggressive? Why are we not out there trying to do everything possible to help our partners to improve ratings? Just throw something out that you think would be a good idea for this league. Market everywhere. Don't just put an ad in an NBA product. You see plenty of ads when you're already watching an NBA game. But if you're watching anywhere else, you're not going to see an ad to know when the game is. Um, you know, we're not aggressive in street level marketing. When I first got to the league, I said, you know, the Mavs didn't make the playoffs, that's a shame, but why don't you let me throw some playoff watching parties? Mm. I'll promote them, you know, we'll get some of the players who are still in town. We don't do that kind of thing. You know, why don't you send me some posters or some ads, you know, for our, our games that are gonna be on for the playoffs. I'll get out there, I'll run them here. We don't do that kind of thing. You know, why don't we get a national sales force that goes out and, and recruits teams of kids that go into schools, because you know, the NBA has the, still has the biggest impact on fashion and mm -hmm, culture mm -hmm. you know, in kids, white, black, 
you know, all nationalities and in, in, um, up through probably 18 years old. Let's direct some people, to, some kids to get out there and interface with them, not just in, in cities where there's NBA teams, but in other cities as well. You are good for this game, aren't you? I don't know. I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't think about it that way. I just, this is who I am and this is what I do. You know, and if, 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 if you I'm knew, be, I guess here's my last question. If you knew what you were saying or doing could in any way hurt this game, would, would you finally it. shut up? Yeah. 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 But if you've I, never felt that. No, not, not ever. Not, at the exact opposite. We thank our guests Kobe Bryant, Alan Iverson, and Mark Cuban for joining us on Up Close Primetime. I'm Roy Firestone. Thanks for watching. Good night. Up Close Prime Time is a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com.